it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel become, uh, became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then this man said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps became, uh, came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition for, uh, to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Verse 13. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is the one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his Lord, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, no diversions were brought to him, and sleep fed from him, fled from him. Then at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near the den, to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius 
wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Then we go to Philippians 4, verses 4 to 7. The word of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thus far the reading of God's holy and inerrant word. Let us pray. Our all-merciful and all-wise God, shine into the hearts, our hearts, by the pure light of knowing you. Open the eyes of our minds by the Holy Spirit to reflect on your teaching and put into us the holy respect of your blessed word and our Lord Jesus Christ, who from eternity past was the word and is the word for the coming eternity. For you are our light, and to you we give all glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Dear Congregation of Christ, last Sunday we learned that uh, three of the most common idioms uh, in the Eng English language originated from this book of Daniel. The writing on the wall, your days are numbered, and you have been weighed and found wanting. Today, we have another household idiom that comes from this book, Lion's Den, which means a dangerous or threatening place or situation. So thus far in our reading, of, uh, our readings or studies of this prophetical book, we have learned how God had delivered Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the lions, from lions' dens, dangerous and even impossible situations. In chapter 1, they refused to eat kings, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's food and drink the king's wine, and God made them healthier and wiser than all the other young men in the palace. In chapter 2, the king ordered all Babylon's wise men, including Daniel, to be executed because they could not tell the king what his dream was and what it meant. But God revealed the dream and its meaning to Daniel, so his life was spared. In chapter 3, Daniel's three friends refused to worship the golden image that the king set up, so they were cast into the fiery furnace, but one, like a son of the gods, preserved them from being burned into ashes. In chapter 5 last Sunday, we learned about Belshazzar, the last king of Babylon, to whom God sent the handwriting on the wall that foretold his doom. That same night that he held a great feast with a thousand of his lords, his wives, and concubines, Belshazzar was defeated and killed by Darius, the Medo-Persian. Today, in chapter 6, we will study a most familiar uh, story about Daniel. He refused to obey the king's edict to address his petitions to the king. Rather, as was his custom, he prayed to God not in secret, 
but openly where everyone could see and hear him. For defying the king, he was thrown into an actual lion's den to a certain and speedy death. But in the morning he was untouched, because even in the face of the most certain and painful death, he had trusted and prayed to his God, not to a pagan king or God. This morning we will pay thoughtful and solemn attention to God's word concerning the theme of words from uh, the book of Daniel. The theme is because Daniel had trusted in his God. So firstly, we read that Daniel prayed and gave thanks before his God. Do you think that dirty politics was invented by our politicians today? Think again. Jesus was crucified because of Jews and Romans playing dirty politics. And as far back as 500 years before our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world, Daniel became an innocent victim of dirty politicians. In chapter 6, the Babylonian Empire was already defeated by the Medes and Persians. So Daniel now is uh, serving under Darius, the Persian king. But at this time, Daniel had been in public service for 70 years. So he was an old man by this time. In Daniel chapter 2, because of Daniel's godly knowledge and wisdom, Nebuchadnezzar made him governor of the province of Babylon. He served so well in Babylon that Belshazzar promised to him that he would be appointed the third most powerful man in the empire. Even Darius the Persian was impressed by him so that he appointed Daniel to be one of the three highest administrators in the empire who will oversee satraps or local governors. Later, as Daniel continued to get an excellent job performance review, Darius planned to appoint Daniel as the empire's prime minister, second only to the king. So the the scheme of Daniel's enemies was brilliant. They petitioned the king to sign into law a bill saying that everyone in the empire must route their prayers to their gods through the king alone. How can Darius refuse this affirmation of his absolute power over everyone? So with his ego buttered up, Darius promptly signed the bill into law. He did not even notice or maybe ignored that Daniel was not even among these psychopaths or conspirators. As soon as Daniel heard of the king's edict, he went into a panic attack. No, certainly not. As if nothing has happened, he continued with his daily practice of praying to God three times a day, with his windows opened toward Jerusalem. He prayed in the sight and hearing of all passing by, including the conspirators. He had complete peace in his heart because he had faith and trust in God alone, knowing that in praying openly to God would cost him his life. And it did not help that he was an exile, a foreigner, one of the exiles from Judah, as his enemies called him, in verse 13. Surely, we cannot know if in the same life and death situations, we would stand firm in our faith in Christ our Lord. Can we stand firm if we were left in a coliseum with lions and other wild beasts as a kind of a Super Bowl entertainment for ancient Romans screaming for blood? Are we able to pray 
and sing praise to God as the flames of a stake start to engulf us, or as the sword of a terrorist is about to sever our head from our body? No, we do not know if we can, but we know that prayer can give us both peace and boldness in such dire situations. As the Apostle Paul assures us in our reading, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace that God gives us is beyond all our understanding. And so he exhorts us in 1 Thessalonians, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. Daniel prayed without ceasing before and after he was cast into the den of lions. Secondly, Daniel said to the king, after he was rescued by God from the lions, because I was found blameless before him. So when Darius was about to appoint Daniel to be prime minister of the empire of Persia, here comes the dirty politicians and psychophants manipulating the king. They were green with envy and so jealous of Daniel that they tried to dig up dirt about Daniel, but, but they found only diamonds in his character. In verse 4, they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. With regards to his performance as an administrator, he was faultless and without corruption. And so they figured that the only way to nail Daniel is through his faithfulness to God's law, to his, to his God's law. Surely they could find a scheme to make him pay for his trust in God over his obedience to the king's command. Does this not remind you of dirty politics in our nation, especially against Christians? Whenever a Christian runs or nominated for high office, anti-Christian mud is plastered on his face. Justice Brett Kavanaugh was accused by several women of sexual assaults all the way back to high school. These lying women turned out to have been set-ups. And Justice Amy Coney Barrett, she was accused of not being a good mother to seven children, of white supremacy for adopting two black uh, children from Haiti, of being anti-feminist, and of being a false Christian. This unfounded smear campaigns against both are rooted in the God-hating leftist ideology of our godless culture. And this is why very few Christians want to run for high public office. Obviously, both of these justices are not faultless, blameless, as Daniel told King Darius. In the absolute sense of the word, no one is blameless. Not Noah, not Job, not David, and not even Paul. All of them were referred to or called themselves as blameless. The word blameless is a translation of a Hebrew word which means unblemished, complete, whole, entire, or sound. David says to God in Psalm 51, 4, You are blameless in your judgment. Since God is perfect, therefore it means perfection in the absolute sense. But the Bible teaches that every single human being inherits Adam's sinful nature and therefore are sinners. 
David says in Psalm 51, 5, In sin did my mother conceive me. Paul also says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that all are by nature children of God's wrath. If this is the case, how can the Bible call Noah, Job, David, and Paul himself blameless? The reason for this distinctive of true believers in God and in Christ as blameless is their position before God as believers. Their position means their standing before God. When a sinner believes in Christ and repents of his sins, God forgives him of all his sins, past, present, and future. His promise is clear, especially in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He declares us acquitted or not guilty of our sins. Therefore, he sees us as perfectly righteous before him. Again, in David's heartfelt confession of his sins of adultery and murder in Psalm 51, he pleads to God to be merciful to him, to blot out, wash thoroughly, cleanse all his sins and transgressions, and to make him whiter than snow. And this is how God sees us as blameless in his sight after he forgives a truly repentant sinner. This is why David's mood changes from sorrow and mourning over his sins to joyful singing of God's praise and righteousness in verses 14 and 15 of Psalm 51. But how then can the most holy and just God forgive sinners? Does he just ignore and quaint at them to ease their conscience? No, God forgives our sins with a most heavy price, the precious blood and broken body of his only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as the Apostle John says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He lived a blameless life. Therefore, as the sacrifice for sin, he met the requirement of a lamb without blemish or spot from the Old Testament. Therefore, when you repent and believe in him as your only Savior, God counts your sins to his Son and at the same time, time counts his Son's blameless life to your account. This is the great exchange. Paul teaches this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He bore the wrath of God his Father as our substitute lamb, because God transferred all his sins, all the sins of his people, to his account. Daniel prayed without ceasing before and after he was cast into the lion's den. He affirmed before God and before Darius that he was blameless because he had been forgiven of his sins. Lastly, he said, after Darius found him alive in the morning, my God shut the lion's mouths. Why would God allow Daniel to be surely mauled to death by the lions? We read God's purpose in the words of both King Darius and Daniel. So because the king's most favored official was Daniel, even after the accusation against him, he was greatly distressed. After he heard the conspirators, he spent the whole day trying to find a solution, a compromise to save Daniel's 
life. But the law was law, and it was irrevocable according to Daniel's enemies. The same night before Daniel was cast into the lion's den, the king prayed or wished for him. May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. Maybe he remembered some story about Daniel's three friends who were delivered by God from the fiery furnace. Still, he fasted and he tossed and turned all night. Therefore, as soon as dawn broke, he hurried to the lion's den to see for himself if the God of Daniel delivered him from death. In anguish, because he was sure that Daniel was already mangled to pieces, he shouted to Daniel, asking him if God had saved him from the lions. Lo and behold, Daniel answered. He said, my God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Daniel's words were words of praise and thanksgiving to God for delivering him. He had peace even when the lions were all around him, just as he had peace when he heard about the accusation against him that meant death. If he was going to die, he would die in peace, knowing that he had done no wrong before God and before men. The angel of God had not only protected him, but also comforted him all night. Who knows what things did the angel told him that gave him assurance and comfort all night. The Bible is full of reversals in the end. Remember what happened to a Jew named Mordecai and his enemy Haman in the book of Esther. Haman hated the Jews and plotted gen genocide against them. He also built a gallows, tall gallows, <clears throat> where he would hang Mordecai. In the end, Queen Esther revealed to the king about Haman's evil scheme. And so instead of Mordecai hanging from his gallows, Haman himself was hanged there in his own gallows. Instead of the Jews being annihilated, Haman and all the enemies of the Jews were killed. So it is here in Daniel. Instead of Daniel being eaten by the lions, Darius sent all of Daniel's enemies and their wives and their children into the lion's den. The king then issued a decree praising the God of Daniel, acknowledging that God is an ever-living God who is eternal king. This God delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. This is God's purpose in sending Daniel into the lion's den, that his name will be glorified and exalted by showing that to Daniel and to Darius that he is the most wise and most powerful king in the world. Like Nebuchadnezzar, after God restored his sanity, Darius acknowledged God as the almighty and sovereign God of heaven and earth. He delivers and rescues whom he wills. He works signs and wonders whenever and wherever he wills. He controls all great things, all nature, all people, all nations, and all events. And he even sends his angels to rescue those whom he wills. But does God send comfort and deliverance to all his people in all circumstances? Uh, circumstances, not at all. For he did not send his angels to rescue his people who were being fed to lions and wild beasts in Roman Colosseums. He did not rescue thousands of faithful Christians from the sword 
from the burning stake and from torture and death at the hands of the Inquisition. Today, there are countless faithful believers who die at the hands of terrorists. Thousands of God's people all over the world have had terrible sickness and even died from the pandemic. Our Lord Jesus Christ solemnly warns us to be faithful in all our situations because persecutions and sufferings are from our enemy is certain. But the most important salvation that God brings is the salvation of our souls through faith alone in Christ alone. Our utmost prayer is that God will find us totally blameless and completely cleansed of our sins on Judgment Day so that he will deliver us from God's wrath in the lion's den. Dear brothers and sisters, we read in the last verse that Daniel prospered throughout the reign of Darius and the next Persian king, Cyrus. God prospered him throughout his trials and persecutions, rescuing him from death twice thus far in this first six chapters. The lion's den is merely a picture of God's wrath in eternal hell. It is the destination of those who reject God and his word, our Lord Jesus Christ. They instead worship pagan idol gods, real and idols of the heart. They hate Christ. They hate Christians. They hate his word and reveal, that reveals our sins. In fact, they hate the word sin and hell. But on Judgment Day, they will be cast into the eternal lion's den because they will not be found blameless in Christ. This unbelief and rebellion are the reasons why unbelievers crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross was our Lord's lion's den. God poured out his wrath on him because he bore all our sins. God did not send his angels to rescue and comfort him on the cross, but he himself was blameless in his life, a sinless lamb without blemish or spot, who sacrificed himself to rescue and deliver us from God's eternal wrath. Therefore, remember that we who believe in him as Savior and Lord are united to him in his life, death, and resurrection. Let us then strive to live holy and blameless lives like our Lord to the glory of God. Let us pray. O holy and merciful God, our Father in heaven, we praise you for revealing to us your purpose in sending Daniel to the lion's den and then rescue him from certain death. We give you thanks that you rescued us from your wrath through the sacrifice of our blameless and spotless Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. We now humbly ask you to send your Holy Spirit to our hearts so that we may lead a holy and blameless life until we obtain complete holiness and blamelessness in the heavenly places. All glory be to you, our Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, our Counselor, one God in three persons. Amen.